Hello, everyone. Welcome. So Jane Lindholm turns out did speak to us many years ago. So this is exciting. I think it was maybe before Betsy. Do you remember her? No, this is ancient history. Ancient. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, well, you know, it happens. So Jane Lindholm is the host, executive producer and creator of the But Why. She launched But Why in 2016 and has gone on to become one of the most popular kids podcasts in the world. In addition to But Why, she produces special projects to Vermont Public, including a national Merle award-winning project commemorating the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Until March 2021, she was host and editor of the award-winning Vermont Public Program, Vermont Edition. Remember that? Yes. Jane joined Vermont Public in 2007 to expand Vermont Edition from a weekly pilot into a flagship daily news magazine. She's been recognized with dozens of regional and national accolades during her time in Vermont. Prior to joining Vermont Public, she was the director of the national business program Marketplace based in Los Angeles. She began her journalism career at NPR in Washington, DC. Shortly after graduating from Harvard University with a BA in anthropology, she lives with her family in Addison County. And please give a warm welcome to Jane Lindholm. Thank you. What a pleasure it is to be here. And I, I think the last time I was here was like 14 or 15 years ago. I also did um, a, a program up in St. Albans maybe 17, 16 years ago now. And that was the first talk I ever gave. And I was so nervous. It was the second talk. The first one went very badly. And the second one I said, please just bear with me. I'm so nervous. And everybody was so kind. It was a, a DE program in St. Albans that it made everything easier after that. Um, and you know, I feel like I don't even have to give a speech now because yeah, you know my whole bio. So we're good to go, right? I, I don't have to say anything, but it it's a true pleasure to be here. I'm I'm so honored that you have any interest in hearing what I have to say. And it's such a treat, even 16, 17 years on, to still be in conversation with Vermonters, which is something I, I don't take for granted. And I never thought when I moved back home would be something that was a possibility for me. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what motivates me, uh, my history here in Vermont, and play you some audio from some of my favorite interviews and programs over the years. But I'd like to start by asking any of you if you remember the TV show, Frasier. Not the reboot, which hasn't started, but Frasier, right? You know, it's about a psychiatrist. He used to hang out at the bar Cheers, and then he got his own spinoff show, moved to Seattle, started a call-in radio show, lived with his dad, always having misunderstandings because he was such a snob, but deep down, he was really good-hearted, right? I know it's just a TV show, but at one point, and this was well before any Kelsey Grammer controversy, I had a borderline unhealthy obsession with the show. I say unhealthy because the reruns aired on cable TV at 11 p.m. Two episodes, back to back, ending at midnight. And I watched that show every single night. I watched 11 seasons worth. And at the time, I couldn't quite figure out, like, why am I so compelled to watch this show? I mean, it's funny, but it's not that funny. Certainly not worth staying up until midnight to watch it, especially when I have this new job and I need to be sharp at about 7 a.m. It took me about three months before I started to figure out why I was so drawn to the show. Frazier had left a comfortable home and his friends and moved to his hometown on the other side of the country. Wait a minute. I had just moved away from Los Angeles and was now living in my hometown in Middlebury. Frazier was just starting a somewhat bewildering new job hosting a call-in radio show. I was just starting a somewhat bewildering new job hosting a call-in radio show. Frazier was living with his father. I was living with my father. Suddenly it all made sense. I was looking for some sort of shared experience. And I was watching ahead in this TV show to reassure myself that all the stress and fear and anxiety that I was feeling was going to result in something successful. That I had made a good decision to move back to Vermont and start up this new show that VPR was just getting going. When VPR, which I know is no longer called VPR, but 
Yeah, and I, I, I imagine there are feelings about that. When the formerly known as VPR hired me, I had never had a single minute of live radio under my belt as a host. I had been working as the director of Marketplace, which was the public radio business show in LA, and I had actually been doing a lot of national reporting on top of my directing duties. But standing in front of a, a, in front of a live microphone that was broadcasting what I said as I said it, zero seconds. So this was an incredibly nerve-wracking move. And I think Fraser was a kindred, albeit fictional spirit. There were, though, some distinct differences between my life and Fraser's life. <laughs> Mine was a lot less glamorous. Fraser was trying to keep Eddie the dog off his precious furniture. He was getting in trouble for trafficking in illegal imported Russian caviar. And I can remember one night, not long after I had moved back to Vermont, I was standing in the kitchen of my dad and stepmother's house in Cornwall, and I was mixing up this delicious concoction of eucalyptus, lavender, and olive oil. Boy, it sounds like I'd start to a really great recipe, doesn't it? But the recipe was for slathering on my scalp. I rubbed it in. I sat under a shower cap for the next couple of hours, trying not to drip. Probably watched an episode of Frasier. I was 28 years old. I was living with my parents. And my 10-year-old sister had just given me head lice again. So mine felt like a very different kind of sitcom setup. And at that moment, I nearly packed up and slunk back to the West Coast. But that was more than 16 years ago, and clearly I'm still here. And I'm still here because I find my work and this place endlessly fascinating. And I feel so lucky to be able to do what I'm doing where I'm doing it. For 14 years, as the host of Vermont Edition, I spent my days learning about issues important to my home state and talking to interesting people about them. Other people, maybe you, listened to those conversations and sometimes called in to participate. And then I got paid, essentially, just to be curious. About eight years ago, I got interested in making a podcast. Vermont Public still didn't have any shows that were made as podcasts, as opposed to shows that were made for broadcast that were then put onto a stream for on-demand listening. So I thought, maybe I could do this and it would be good for me as an adventure and for the station to experiment with. I looked at this landscape of podcasts, it was already booming, and I realized that I was gonna have to go to a part of the podcast landscape that wasn't as full or as popular um, as some of the others if I wanted to be able to have any traction. And the market for kids programming was totally undersaturated. So I figured I could make a show for kids and have a chance of capturing a decent market share. And not only that, but public media has a mission to provide lifelong learning. And we, the radio side at least, hasn't been doing it much for kids. So I brainstormed ideas. I was still hosting Vermont Edition at the time, so I knew this had to be something that I could make in about a quarter of my working hours. And I hit on the idea of a show where the kids sent us the questions, and then we found interesting people to answer them. Essentially, an interview show for kids where they choose the topics. My colleague, Melody Baudet, immediately offered her support, and in 2016, we launched But Why, a podcast for curious kids. As you heard, our show is now one of the most popular kids' podcasts in the world. We have well over 30 million downloads. We have gotten more than 13 thousand questions. And we've heard from kids in all of the US states and territories and more than 90 other countries. And it's the most popular recurring show that Vermont Public has ever made by a factor of 10. Thank you. I don't think any of us, uh, certainly I didn't, but I don't think my uh, managers and superiors thought that that's what would happen. So it's so big and became so big that it became impossible to give both Vermont Edition and But Why equal attention. And a couple of years ago, I stepped down from Vermont Edition so that I could focus more fully on But Why and some other special projects for the station, and partly so that Vermont Public and Vermont Edition could have some fresh new voices and new perspectives. And, you know, it's been pretty amazing. But unless 
lest you think I swapped uh, a kind of a challenging job for an easier one, I'm going to play you some of the questions that I now have to grapple with that I never had to grapple with on uh, Vermont Edition. And we just have to do some like fancy trickery here with the audio, so give me a sec. Hello, my name is Jones. I am eight years old and I live in Courtney, Canada. And my question is, why aren't there wizards and witches in this world? Hi, my name's Emma. I'm six years old. I live in St. Paul, Minnesota. And my question is, why do you say, hmm, when you're thinking? Hi, my name is Max. I am 11 years old. I live in Seattle, Washington. And my question is, why, when someone tells you not to do something, it makes you want to do it more? My name is Sarah. I'm five years old. I live in Germany. Why do people cry tears of joy? Hi, my name is Gemma. I'm nine years old and I live in Needham, Massachusetts. My question is, who is the first teacher to teach a teacher? My name is Rowan. I'm four years old. I live in Minnesota and my trust in this. Why do we say ah uh, when we're done drinking water? I couldn't hear that last one. It's why do we say ah uh, when we stop drinking water? I don't know. There are a myriad questions that we get from kids, from our young listeners, and they want to know things. They want to know everything. There are a couple of topics we probably won't tackle on the show. Like we're probably never gonna do an episode about whether Santa Claus is real or not. That's one we're gonna leave to families. But we have explored some really complex questions over the couple of years, including this one. Hi, my name is Stevie. I live in Barbados. I am six years old, and, and my question is, why are little sisters and brothers so annoying? And goodbye. Hi, my name is Juniper. I am seven years old. I live in Abington, Pennsylvania, and my question is, why can little brothers be so annoying? Because I have a little brother, and he's really annoying. Why are little brothers and sisters so annoying? And equally, why are big brothers and sisters so annoying? Um, we've also tackled this one. My name is Khaled. I'm six years old. And I live in the United Arab Emirates. My question is, why do some people choose to be a bully and some people don't? My name yeah, so we've talked about bullying. Why do some people become bullies? Why are some people bullied by other people? And some people never have to worry about bullies. And we've tackled this question that actually, I mean, this is a little bit of nepotism, but my son sent this one in shortly after the Russia-Ukraine war started. My name is Dylan, and I live in Moncton, Vermont, and I'm eight. And my question is, why, why does Russia think they're doing the right thing? That's a pretty tricky one. Why does Russia think they're doing the right thing? It was more than just what's the history of this conflict, which we actually were able to describe in some pretty interesting ways as being a little bit like um, kids sitting at lunch tables and Russia wanting Ukraine to sit at the same lunch table, which it had for many centuries, but wasn't always kind to Ukraine at that lunch table and Ukraine maybe wanting to sit at a lunch table with other European countries. But that question of why would Russia do this? If, if you're telling me it's wrong, why do they think it's right? I mean, these are really challenging questions that we get from kids and they are not easy to answer in fact, it's much easier to answer questions that adults send in. But if we tell kids, oh, that's not an appropriate question, or, oh, you don't have to worry about that, you're too young, when they ask about these big topics or about something like death, then we're telling them that there are some things that it's not okay to wonder about or to want to know and that they don't deserve an answer. Our mission on But Why is to celebrate and encourage curiosity in all its forms 
for our entire lives. And luckily, a lot of the questions that we get are not that hard. They're just pure fun, like this one. Hi, my name is Shen Shen. I am seven years old. I live in Lowbrain, California. My question is, do skunks like the smell of themselves? Do skunks like the smell of themselves? Um, in case you're curious, we actually talked with a Vermont naturalist named Mary Holland for that episode, and she had to do some research because it wasn't a question she had ever pondered either. And in her research, she discovered a place called the Dragoo Institute for the Betterment of Skunks and Skunk Reputation. It's a real place. And she informed us that skunks actually probably do not like the way that they smell. Uh, they definitely do not like the way other skunks smell. They will try to roll around, um, root around if they have a spray on their faces. They try very hard not to be sprayed by another skunk and in fact, very rarely get any of their own spray on themselves, although maybe on a windy day. Uh, and so, you know, I, I feel like I learned something new in that episode. And then here's another of my absolute favorite questions. My name is Corinne. I'm six years, six and a half, and I live in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm going to start first grade. And my question is, why are jellyfishes made of jelly? Or are they made of jelly? And why do they have stickers that want to touch it? I love that we get audio from kids. In case you couldn't hear what she was saying, she's saying, why are jellyfishes made out of jelly? Or are they made out of jelly? And why do they have stingers? I want to touch it. And you can just sense that enthusiasm. And maybe some of us have felt the same way, but feel a little bit as we get older, like we can't ask those kinds of questions or can't have that kind of enthusiasm. And one of the best things about making But Why is that we have an excuse through kids to investigate those kinds of questions. We don't need a news hook. We don't need something that's happened out there in the world that then allows us to do a recap. We get to go wherever kids' curiosity is. And in fact, it's usually where I am curious too. And then we find out things about the world that we didn't know before. In fact, being curious is basically what I've made a career out of. My job, whether it was hosting Vermont Edition, or Now But Why, or earlier in my career at NPR and American Public Media has been about following curiosity and asking questions. And I actually have my very first boss to thank for a lot of that. I started my career in 2001 when I got hired to work on a show called Radio Expeditions, which was a co-production of National Geographic and NPR. Carolyn Jensen, who was the executive producer of that show, had found my resume in a pile of intern applications. I had not applied for an internship at NPR, but I had at one point had a conversation. You know, I knew someone who knew someone who knew someone whose dad knew someone who was the CEO of NPR. And I had this conversation on the phone with him, and then I sent him my resume. I was a college senior, so it was mostly waitressing and summer camp work. And I think he very kindly had this conversation and then put my resume in a pile to gather dust, which was entirely appropriate. But Carolyn Jensen found it and she thought I looked like an appealing candidate. And she liked my mix of travel. I had lived in both South America and um, East Africa by then in study abroad programs in high school and college. And I had studied anthropology and she thought that was a good match for the show that she made. And so she called the house because Everybody still had house phones. I still do have a house phone at, to offer me a job. Um, this was surprising to me <laughs> because I had not applied for a job, but also because I had no idea what I was going to do with my life at the time. And I was in this very sort of bewildering spot. I had just graduated from college and I had gone off to write for Let's Go Travel Guides, uh, which was a student production at Harvard University. And so I was a writer for the Let's Go Spain guide. And I had left just three days after graduation. And two days later, while I was on that trip, I got word that one of my very closest friends, a fellow Let's Go writer named Haley Surti, had been killed in a bus accident in Peru writing for Let's Go. 
I was devastated. All of the writers who were on assignment were offered a chance to keep writing on location where we were or to cancel our contracts and come home. I had really wanted to do this adventure in Spain, but it was where Haley had gone to study abroad and she had gone to Peru to travel in some of the places where I had gone during my study abroad semester. And I just couldn't be in these places that reminded me of her. And I wanted to see her one more time, see her family, see my family. So I left the book to someone else and I went to Pittsburgh to say goodbye to Haley. And then I came home to Vermont with no job and no idea what I was gonna do to make enough money to survive. So when Carolyn called and left a message with my stepmother, I actually thought that it was an ill-advised attempt at a pick-me-up by a friend who knew I was down in the dumps and loved NPR. And I almost didn't call back. But it was real. And Carolyn offered me an internship. And I said, yes, I love an internship. And she said, well, we can't pay you. I said, oh, then I can't do it. And she said, okay, we can pay you. Not much. Uh, you know, I still waitressed, but she made it possible for me to go to DC and start this internship and work on this amazing show called Radio Expeditions. The point of Radio Expeditions was to go out with explorers and adventurers and scientists around the world and capture audio and then take it back and spend weeks crafting a sound rich narrative that they could then air on Morning Edition. I did not get to travel with the team to these amazing locations, but I did get to listen to 36, 48, 72 hours of sound that they would bring back with them. My job as the intern was to transcribe this sound. And to give you a taste of what that means, it, let me take you to their trip to the Central African Republic, where they were following researchers who were learning about how elephants communicate. Elephants have these very low frequency calls that they can make back and forth to one another over a distance of a mile or more. And the scientists were studying what these calls mean and how elephants talk. So my job was to transcribe hours and hours of elephant sounds and try to create a written transcript that would help Carolyn and her husband, Alex Chadwick, the regular reporter of the segment, pick which sounds to use in their story. This is what a bunch of elephant sounds sound like when you're trying to transcribe them. That was 46 seconds. I had to do this for hours. And my job was to write things in the transcript like low grumble, loud rumble, long emphatic moan. And I did this for weeks. It was both amazing and very tedious, hilarious, sometimes heartwarming, sometimes very confusing. But what it was most of all was a lesson in the power of sound and how when you pair it with really good writing, you can bring a story to life for your listeners. You can put them inside the scene, make them feel like they are there with those elephants. And later on, I could use that to help people feel like they were invested in conversations about very charged issues, including things like the F-35 debate. And when you can add empathy to the mix in your writing or your interviewing. You can help your audience understand, for example, the grief of a parent who has lost a child to the opioid overdose epidemic and how that human experience connects to policy and politics. That very first radio job I had transcribing the sounds of elephants calling to one another across the distance also gave me a lesson in what it's like to have a mentor and a boss who believes in you. And in many ways, I owe my career to Carolyn Jensen, who became a friend. She died in 2010, but
but I hope that in some way I am carrying her legacy. And when I thought about But Why and creating But Why, it was with that experience in mind, that idea that you could take people places and that you, the creator, would have this amazing career helping other people see and understand the world. And so back in 2007, when I got the chance to host my own show, Vermont Edition was just getting off the ground, I also took those lessons to heart. The first few months I was here in the summer of 2007, I was getting up to speed on how to host because remember, not one minute of live radio. And I was getting some vocal training, doing research on the local politics and culture. I hadn't lived here in many years full time. And so I was going around the state to reacquaint myself with Vermont and Vermonters. And then we were putting some of those interviews on All Things Considered and Morning Edition until Vermont Edition got started. And one of the very first interviews that I got to do before anybody knew who I was, was with Vermont's newly installed poet laureate, Ruth Stone, who lived right in my hometown of Middlebury. So I tried to set up this interview, and one of her daughters was the one I was communicating with, and she said to me almost apologetically, well, my mom can't come to the station. You're going to need to do it in her house. She doesn't get around very well, and she's mostly blind. That's no problem, I said. So I went to Ruth's house. And she was waiting with her daughter, Marsha, who I'd been talking with. And because this is Vermont, it turns out Marsha had been my guidance counselor in kindergarten at Mary Hogan. So I showed up totally green, not really knowing what to expect or how to do this thing that we call an interview. And I have to say it got off to a really inauspicious start. They tell you when you're making radio to just start recording and save all of your audio because you never know what you'll get. And we didn't put this on the air, but I still have some of the tape from when we sat down to start this interview. We were trying to sit down, I should say, and Marsha was helping Ruth get settled. And I was just about ready to start interviewing her when this happened. A little bit, but mostly I your parents. This thing has gone dead. The cat went out. Oh no. Oh, Marsha, she can't hear. She can't hear. She's running away from me. I'm not going to chase her. Marsha, she can't hear. Right, Ruth, let me move this microphone in front I of you. I can't hear, darling. Let me the get hearing aid is you let put me, in. Get, get so in so, case you couldn't hear exactly what was happening there, we now have a deaf cat who has escaped, a daughter who's being yelled at, and an interview subject whose hearing aid has failed. My first interview was not going well, but Marsha got Ruth another hearing aid with a new battery, and the cat was fine, and we moved on, and I was 100% charmed by Ruth Stone. To this day, it's one of my favorite interview moments. She's just started singing. Ruth at the time had was really struggling with her memory. And there were a lot of questions that she struggled to answer, couldn't remember back in time as well as she used to be, or um, and sometimes got time periods confused, the past and the present, as you know, I think is is totally natural. She was a nonagenarian. But she all of a sudden remembered this moment and said, have you heard this song? And started singing it. And I'm going to play you Maybe I won't play you the whole song, but I'll play you a minute of it um, because it just, it was wonderful to hear this song that I had never heard that despite the challenges she was having with memory, Ruth could remember word for word. I'd say I've lost 99% of what I've, what come to me. Uh, and that one, I have three daughters. Is, uh, did I sing that one just now? No. Would you like well, to sing I'll, that? I'll sing it to you. I have three daughters, like green gauge plums. They sat all day, sucking their thumbs. And more of the pity, they cried all day. Why doesn't our mother's brown hair turn gray? I have three daughters, like three cherries. They sat at the window, the boys to please, and they couldn't wait for their mother to grow old. 
Why doesn't our mother's brown hair turn to snow? I have three daughters in the apple tree, thing and mama thin daddy with three young lovers to take them away from me. I have three daughters like green gauge plums sitting all day and sighing all day and sucking their thumbs. Saying, Mama, won't you fetch and carry? And Daddy, won't you let us marry? Singing, sprinkle snow down on Mama's hair. And Lordy, give us our share. <laughs> our share of what? <laughs> that's, a, that's a funny one. I just, I just loved hearing her sing that song. And, and you get these moments when you have a show like mine. And I did play you the whole two minutes, but we're going to call it host prerogative. You know, I've never done an interview at this point, And here's this brilliant woman singing into my microphone. And that was really, I think, the first moment that I realized, oh, people will open up to you. Microphones are intimidating, but they're also freeing. They're freeing for the people who are answering questions that maybe they've never been asked before. And they are freeing for the interviewer who gets to ask questions that perhaps you wouldn't even ask of your own family members. There are certainly ways to do that very, very wrong too. But you know, you'd think somebody's gonna clam up on a microphone and instead it often makes them open up instead. It's a real privilege. And it's an honor to get to hear people's remarkable stories. And sometimes, at least in my previous job, start statewide conversations around ideas that are sparked by those stories. I remember one conversation we did on Vermont Edition. Uh, there was a, a woman I knew who told me that after many months of trying to get pregnant and then learning that there was no hospital in Vermont that would do IVF treatments for her because she had already turned 40, the overwhelming feeling she had was isolation and grief. And it wasn't so much her story that she wanted told. It was the pain and sadness that she felt and the feeling that she had to hide all of this grief from her coworkers and acquaintances because she didn't have a baby. And she felt at the time, you don't talk about these things. You don't talk about failed pregnancies. You don't talk about the grief that you have over something that isn't even there. But she told me about it. And we did a show and we asked people to write in or call in to talk about their emotions or their experiences with infertility and to share what they wanted people to know about how to help. And I, I don't pretend that that lessened anyone's grief significantly, but there are moments where if you're able to come together with other people who are having similar experiences, even if you don't see them or know them or ever get to talk to them again, it can at least for a little bit of time help lessen that isolation. We planned an episode segment several years ago now about what was then a still relatively newish drug treatment gaining in popularity called buprenorphine. It's sometimes now um, better known as Suboxone and it's used to treat opioid use disorder. We thought at the time that we would do 20 minutes on it with some doctors who could tell us how it works, but that beyond that, Vermonters wouldn't have much interest in hearing about it. What we didn't account for was the number of people who were living with addiction or recovering from addiction to opioids who wanted to call in to talk about that experience. And they wanted to talk about their experiences in active addiction. They wanted to talk about treatment protocol. They wanted to talk about a lack of access to treatment. We wound up dropping the other two segments that we had planned and we went the full hour just listening to people's powerful stories of loss and renewal. And now, of course, perhaps a decade on, we see that the opioid epidemic continues to grow and has devastated so many families in Vermont and beyond. It's more than a decade now, but still very present in my mind when Tropical Storm Irene hit Vermont. At the time, I think uh, BPR was a little slow on the uptake. We didn't realize what this storm was gonna be like when it first started, but 
once we saw how devastating the damage was and how many people were unable to communicate with their loved ones or to find information using things like the internet, we threw out our normal format of one hour at noon and a rebroadcast at seven. We went live on Vermont Edition for an hour and a half or two hours every day that first week after the storm. And then instead of rebroadcasting, we went live again at 7 p.m. And the things people told us were heartbreaking and inspiring. Sometimes it was just people saying, I need to get to a doctor's appointment and Route 4 is closed. Do you know how I can get there? I don't have the internet. And Ross Sneed, who was our news director at the time, um, got the name Tom Tom because he would be in the studio and he would just look it up and he was like a personal GPS for Vermonters. And he'd say, oh, I've got a route for you. Here's how you're going to get to Route 4 because you can't use this road, but you can use this road. And then he would say it slowly so the caller could write it down. And then sometimes somebody else would call in five minutes later and say, well, I'm actually headed to Dartmouth-Hitchcock too. If, if you can be at this intersection at 9 a.m., I can give you a ride. People would call in and express concern because they hadn't heard from their uncle since the storm and the phone lines were down. And then half an hour later, we'd get an email from someone who said, yeah, Joe's okay. I saw him out in his front yard this morning. I'll tell him you're worried. One evening that first week, there was a call for animal feed. The pearly cows in South Royalton were out of food and they were in desperate need. By the next morning, people were showing up with hay and pellets. One woman wrote to us after things had settled down a little bit and said, you know, every day at noon during that week, my kids and my dog and I would get in our car and roll down the windows and sit there and listen to your broadcast. It was the only contact we had with the regular world until our roads were repaired and it was our lifeline. I, I say this with all sincerity, it is a remarkable privilege to be the conduit of this kind of information and to have people trust us, trust me, with their questions, their concerns, their stories, and now their children. Although I actually have to admit, not everybody trusts me or opens up like Ruth Stone did. It's been several years now, but I, I think it's still gonna be on my tombstone someday that I'm the one Bernie Sanders hung up on. People still ask me about it. We were doing an interview about a letter that the Senator had sent out after the shooting of Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. The Sanders team had released a letter condemning the attack as many senators had, but attached to the end of this letter was a fundraising message asking people to give to his reelection campaign. As you can imagine, that did not go over well. Senator Sanders had initially refused to do any interviews about it. Uh, and my personal take on it was that this was a really unfortunate gap that had just missed the, the overseers at some point. This was something that was attached to every email and somebody else had written it and somebody else had approved it and they just hadn't seen that this was at the end and was really inappropriate. But there was a lot of mounting pressure and complaints and so he agreed to come on Vermont Edition. And I interviewed him in a format that we like to call live to tape, even though nobody uses tape anymore. So that's when we do an interview as if it's live because, you know, for example, you're trying to fit it into a five minute 27 second block, um, and you aren't planning to do any editing or you don't have time to do any editing before the broadcast. And as is the case with many political interviews, Senator Sanders had an agenda and so did I, and they didn't quite match up. He wanted to talk about how Republicans were skewering him on this letter and that if I just read the letter, I would realize what he had been trying to say. What I wanted to talk about was what he was trying to say, because I found it very troubling, not the fundraising part. I thought that was tone deaf, but understandable. I wanted to talk about something else. He had ascribed a motive to the shooter in that email. Um, and he had been talking about, Senator Sanders had been talking about a sort of far right wing, dangerous ideology. He said it was an assault on liberal viewpoints. But at that point, when his letter came out, we didn't know the motive of the shooter. It wasn't public information. So I wanted to ask Senator Sanders about that aspect of his letter. But he did not like the questioning. And although he was very polite the whole time, he hung up on me. But this was a live to tape interview. So we played the whole thing, including the hang up. My hunch is that he got some feedback from his staff after that was played because his next appearance on Vermont Edition with me in the host chair 
came a few months later and it was in person in the studio. And he was remarkably polite and friendly to me, which he hasn't always been. At one point in the, the live interview on the air, I, I guess I accused him of being strident in his viewpoints. And Senator Sanders leaned forward and said softly into the microphone, strident? No, Jane, I'm a gentle soul. As I mentioned, when I first got started on Vermont Edition, I was 28. And I was unknown to Vermont's political circles. And I think a 28-year-old woman can appear rather unthreatening. This turned out to be a position I could use to my advantage when people in power underestimated my capability. I would ask a fairly easy question and smile gently, and then follow up with a hardball they were not expecting. Worked like a charm, doesn't work anymore. I am now a grizzled old timer but I do still employ some of the same tactics. There's a friend of mine who listened to Vermont Edition for years and said he would wait until the sound of my voice, the tone started to go up. Once it hit an octave above where I normally talk, he said that's when I was going for the jugular. He would say it was something like, um, you're having taxpayers pay for this junket to China because you say your presence will help the investors be lured into the project. But governor, what do people in China care who you are? Of course, we all need a break from politics sometimes. And if you listen to the show when I was hosting, you could probably tell that I really, really love animals. I used to watch the show Wild America when I was a kid, and I just desperately wanted to be the host, Marty Stauffer. He got to you know, narrate these documentaries for kids, and it was so cool. I did not have the beard that he had, but I still wish that I could do that job or David Attenborough's job. So uh, I think Vermont Fish and Wildlife knew this. They, they definitely had my number. And they would say every quarter or so, hey, uh, we're going to go out and do some work with rattlesnakes. You want to come? Yes, I did. We're going to go uh, check on hibernating bears and do some work with them to see how they're tolerating wind power developments. Do you want to come? Yes, I do. So I got to go to all of these wonderful things, including doing a lot of work with white nose syndrome in bats. And I was not, certainly not the first. There were some reporters in New York who first broke this story, but I got to go pretty early on um, in the white nose epidemic and report on this amazing and devastating phenomenon. I'm, I'm gonna skip some of the audio so you have time for questions, but I got to go first to this cave called Aeolus Cave in Southern Vermont. And we walked into the cave in February when bats are supposed to be hibernating and all of these bats were flying out. And in fact, they were sort of dipping close to us. None, none of their normal defenses seemed to be working. And then they would flop onto the ground and die. Um, but then if you live in a place and work in a place for long enough, you get to report on what happens next. And while white nose syndrome continues to challenge bat populations throughout much of the country, there are signs of hope. A couple of years ago, I went to a summer area for bats in Salisbury. It's a um, covered bridge that has actually since burned down. But that population of bats had this amazing strength. And so scientists in Vermont have been trying to figure out what do these bats have that others don't. And last summer, I got to go uh, report on a group of federally endangered Indiana bats in the Champlain Valley that have survived and the population has grown and they had no idea that there were this many bats roosting in bat houses. Indiana bats were never known to roost in houses. Um, and it's actually in a spot where I like to take my dog to walk. And so my kids and I have gone out in the summertime at dusk and done our own citizen science bat counting project to see how many bats fly out. And yes, I did get to also go see rattlesnakes I, I was actually pregnant with my first child, but hadn't told anybody, including my parents. My husband did know. And uh, we, we got out of the truck. There are two very small rattlesnake populations in Vermont. They're both in northern Rutland County. And the fish and wildlife scientist I was with said, look, here's a laminated card. It tells you all of the hospitals within a hundred mile radius where there's anti-venom. And I was like, well, why are you showing me? He's like, well, in case I'm the one who gets bitten and I'm incapacitated. And at that moment, I was like, I'm pregnant. So they got to know before I, before anybody else in my family did. Um, 
I have been so lucky to have the life and career that I have and to make it in Vermont, where people are both very kind and generous, but also hold journalists and our media sources to such a high standard. You all set a very high bar, and I'm grateful that at my best, you put your trust in me to share your lives and stories, to grapple with some of the biggest issues we face as communities, and to open up and have conversations. And I wanna thank you for that because 16 years in, I'm not tired of it. There are so many stories to tell and so many ideas to explore. And I'm just grateful that people are willing to let me do that here and willing to listen to me today. Thank you. Hello. Oh, that was great. You are such fun. <laughs> we love you. Um, I should have turned around and made you all close your eyes so that it could be more like radio. <laughs> Any questions over here? Thank you very much. Um, I know that many people in this room remember Art Link Letter and the uh, children, or kids say the darndest thing. I think it was what, what it was. So I was thinking about that, and it seems like in that situation, they were looking at children to kind of amuse us and to, you know, to say things that were unexpected and funny. And what you're doing is to really identify kids as curious, intelligent people. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I thank you for picking up on that. Yeah, we do. We think kids deserve answers as much as adults do, and they deserve them not in a patronizing way, not talking down to kids or again, saying things like, oh, don't worry about that. Kids deserve to get answers, they just maybe need them in a different vocabulary, or they need the vocabulary explained. And I, I think if we can do that for kids in whatever way, whether we're teachers or um, media professionals, or you know, I wish there was more of this on YouTube, that you can help kids feel empowered to be empathetic, thoughtful, inquiring people as they grow up. Oh, we usually have a very curious. There we go. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting uh, life you lead, I would say. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, so my question has to do with, in broad stroke right now, uh, auditory in contrast to visual, early learning and uptake and being entertained and such like. Uh, I'm somewhat uh, raising this question out of my own impression that given as old as I am, TV didn't come along for the first 10 or so years. And so I was very reliant on the radio. And I find through the years, <laughs> it's my steady Freddy friend there, uh, radio. And, and uh, there may be multiple reasons for that, but one may be exposure early and dependence on that channel, so to speak, for, for interacting. And, and later... <laughs> the the visual came on strong and screens now are all the rage so i th that's my preface i don't know if you have anything to add to say on that matter and the other is if i'm right in that kind of assumption there are many other there are multifactorial kind of reasons you could begin to join in this but i am interested in the especially the developmental dependence on auditory in contrast to visual and the ways in which kids today are exposed to visual from from the crepe cradle uh, yeah. and and the implications of that for the future of radio well i mean there are implications on that for the future of how we interact and and how kids are growing up and we see in generations today i mean beyond just the visual this idea of not having to communicate face to face and in many cases not even having to talk on the phone with one another we can do it through text or um, chat online so i think we're already seeing that and i think we're seeing that even in adults you know not just kids even we, I think, are changing our behaviors around how much time we spend with screens. And a lot of the kids today are getting their ideas about screens from us as, you know, we may say you have half an hour of screen time today, and yet there we are on the couch with our cell phones for four hours. Um, and maybe we can say we're reading the New York Times, but they don't know that. Um, I think, you know, there's, there are a couple, uh, first of all, I think audio isn't going to go away. It's changing and certainly the market for it and how a, a, th a, a public radio station can make money is changing. But people still want audio. We still have cars. 
we still want to listen to something when we're in our cars. Um, we have kids who need non-screen time, and a lot of parents are really looking for things that are non-screen time. We actually put But Why episodes on YouTube with no visuals because we know that people actually sometimes pick it up on YouTube, and kids, if given the chance, will stare at that screen with no moving visual for the entire 25 minutes, but that's where they are, so we do sometimes put it there. Um, but we, we know from surveys that a lot of families listen to our episodes in the car and then have conversations about them on their way to and from school. And I mean, this makes me feel a little bit bad, but a lot of them put it on for their kids at bedtime. I don't know whether I'm really boring or I, I would like to think it excites the kids before bedtime and leads to lots of conversations. But, you know, I think we're still often all of us are looking for that kind of less stimulating audio. And there are plenty of kids' podcasts out there now and kids' shows that give them a ton of stimulation, and that's just not our style. But given that we're one of the top 20 kids' podcasts in the world, I think there's some evidence that that is still appealing to people, to have a calm voice, non-video, just something to relax with. And so, you know, we're not going to reach everybody, but the kids and families and classrooms that do want that kind of thing have us. And then, you know, we're not immune to the video world. We do make videos now too. And we just started a series for schools that incorporates uh, 10 five minute videos about things that are happening in the New England landscape each month that will give them an insight maybe that they don't see in their own lives, like really, really microscopic mushrooms um, or an animation of the wing structure of a raptor and how it can soar. And then we pair that with curriculum and activities for them to do and go outside and do. So I, I think there's, it's, it's shrinking, but I think there's still a need for audio and for um, educational, entertaining, less stimulating things. Maybe more mentally stimulating, I'd like to think. Thank you. Um, Dane, I, you, you said you were going to be working on special projects, and I just wondered what you have been working on or what you're going to be working on in terms of a special project other than the but wow so the first really big special project that i worked on after i left vermont edition was the 9 11 remembrance project and melody bodette who works on but why with me and i did that and we spent about four months collecting 70 stories from people with vermont connections and it was multimedia so some of them sent photographs some of them sent poems, a couple sent videos, a lot of people recorded themselves. And then we built a website where it was an interactive way for people to go in and, and sort of let these experiences slide over them. And, you know, it seemed on the face of it like something that maybe shouldn't have taken that long. And it turns out it took a ton of work because we, while our voices were not in it, taking your voice out of the process as a reporter is really hard. Um, it takes a lot of time to work with people. So it was great to be able to have that time to do that. Um, Melody and I also worked with the Vermont PAGE program, the PAGES, who are middle schoolers who work in the State House. And we did PAGE stories where they, they wrote their own stories and then recorded them for radio. And so now, and only the ones who wanted to, but so now they have these stories if they should ever decide to go into politics or, or public media. Um, I also worked on the documentary of Patrick Leahy that aired the day he retired in January. We did two, and that was a TV documentary. Um, and we did a couple of interviews with him in Vermont and Washington, DC, and put together a, a sort of a long form interview piece with him. And then this past year, the special project has been working on school curriculum and videos. And I was hoping to expand that and do a national school-based series for kids about climate change because we know that um, science education is really, especially elementary school teachers are finding it challenging to have the time and the resources to teach science well, and particularly the science of climate change. And so we were hoping we could do that and, and bring that into schools and we didn't get funding for it. So I, right now I'm a little bit at a crossroads. I'm, I'm actually watching the morning show um, now, which much like Frasier, I'm like, why am I so obsessed with this? kind of silly show about morning TV broadcasters. And I think maybe it's because they are at a career crossroads at many points in that show. And, and I think maybe I am too. So give me three months and I'll tell you where I am. 
Okay, so our last question comes from a Zoom observer. How do you reach out to children through school, through their parents who listen? Yeah, how do I reach out to kids? You know, when we started, we um, seeded a few of our questions. So we, we said to our friends and friends of friends and anybody we knew on social media, could you please have your seven-year-old send us a question? And we thought, well, maybe we won't get anybody else to write in. And then it wound up being word of mouth. And the, the popularity of the show grew so quickly that we don't do any, we don't have to do any specific outreach to kids. They come to us. So we say in every episode, you know, record your question, have an adult help you record it. And we get too many questions now. So we don't even, we kind of try to downplay that aspect of it because it's really hard to disappoint 12,000 kids when you can only play 1,000 questions. Um, and then we we do struggle because we'll do a 25 minute episode and we'll have 75 questions about the same topic. It's like, can you put that in without boring people to death? But each kid wants to hear their own voice and should get to hear their own voice. So yeah, and now we're working on specific outreach to specific demographic groups that perhaps don't um, don't have adults who are necessarily going to put but why in front of them. So you know, are there underrepresented or underserved populations of kids? that we could help serve. That's part of the mission of Vermont Public and part of the mission of public television in particular. And so we're really working hard to push Vermont Public on, we need to be better in these areas and we need to be providing high quality, trustworthy, fact-based entertainment for kids. And so that's what kind of what we're working on at the moment. Thank you.